Hi, I'm Naomi Murphy and this is the Locked Up Living podcast where we talk with a wide range of people about harsh aspects of institutional life. We also explore some of the ways to overcome them and to grow and develop. I'm David Jones. So join us every Wednesday morning, six o'clock UK time for a fresh podcast. So today, we're delighted to welcome along Jason War. Jason's associate associate professor in criminology at the University of Nottingham, with research interests in penology, sociology of power, narrative and sensory criminology, and the philosophy of science. And his most recent book, I found fascinating to read. Actually, it's concerned with forensic psychologists employed within the prisons of England and Wales, and is titled "Forensic Psychologists: Prisons, Power, and Vulnerability." And having worked in prisons for two decades and encountered many psychologists that work in um, the criminal justice system, the issues that you raise in the book were really, uh, really relevant. And I think the book should be required reading for all <laughs> forensic psychologists choosing to work in that environment. And am I right in thinking there's a paperback due out in April? Yes. Next year? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, Emerald will be releasing a paperback, which is Somewhat cheaper than the yeah. than the the ridiculously priced hardback, um, uh, but yeah, that will be coming out in April, and I'm hoping to do some sort of uh, kind of social media blitz, uh, so people will be reminded and have my face in front of them uh, again at that point. So, so great, great to have you on and have the chance to discuss it now. Well, thank and, you for um, inviting me. So, you're very welcome. Hello, Jason. Very nice to meet you. Thanks a lot for coming along so i haven't read the book um and i'm not a psychologist i'm a psychotherapist by background but of course having worked in the nhs and the prison service many years i've worked alongside many many psychologists and i have to say um and i don't know whether this will come up later on that relationships are much better now than they were 20 odd years ago so anyway why did you decide to study psychologists employed by HMPPS? Um, well, originally, the the kind of project that I was interested in doing was looking at the manner in which risk technologies kind of existed within the prison service and how they were deployed, who they were deployed by, how they were kind of experienced, um, and how um, the people that were doing the delivery of those risk technologies kind of um, what they thought about those, you know, the the actual practice of doing that. Um, and, and part of my interest in that was that as someone who had been um, 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 uh, sentenced to Her Majesty's Pleasure, a kind of juvenile life sentence, um, in the early 1990s, I had seen the kind of growth and progression of uh, psychologists in general um, within the prison service in the very early 1990s. And that kind of evolve into this kind of widespread uh, recruitment of forensic psychologists in that kind of latter period of the 1990s and the entrenchment of their practice and the development of the division of the forensic psychology um, and the uh, psychological services within the prison service. So I'd seen that kind of transition. But along with that transition, I'd seen a drift from what had been um, kind of psychologists employed in a th therapeutic context uh, and often in uh, young offender institutions and in juvenile offense, uh, institutions, you know, where their their practice was really around, um, as I said, therapy, therapeutic kind of interventions, but also counselling um, and, and that side of the kind of psychology business. By the time that you get to 1997, 1998, the vast majority of psychologists that were employed in the prison service were actually forensic psychologists and were not doing that kind of job at all. Their job was risk assessments and the delivery of uh, offending behaviour programmes, often cognitively informed or cognitive um, behavioural therapy informed kind of offending behavior programs so what you'd seen is that kind of shift and when that shift occurred you had a very changed relationship between psychologists in general 
and the people who were on the kind of sharp end of their their practice, as it were. You then get, as you kind of emerge into the 2000s, the consolidation of that, and specifically with NOMS and the um, the public protection agenda that came with um, 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 the creation of NOMS in 2004. And the, the real consolidation is that of being the major and primary concern of practitioners within the, the criminal justice system, not just even prisons, but in the criminal justice system. So you then see another shift and a real formalizing of that kind of shift in the direct practice and in the um, uh, kind of institutional organization of psychologists within the prisons. Interestingly enough, once you start hitting around 2010, 2011, um, and a slightly different attitude started to emerge uh, politically um, with, re with regards to prisons uh, and probation and the kind of criminal justice system. What you then start to get is kind of privatizing logics, um, also kind of implementing into uh, uh, the, the delivery of, 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 of psychological services in the prison. And that begins to fragment the service a little bit. But also with the fragmenting of that service comes a return to some of those older kind of more therapeutic practices that had kind of been lost in the early 1990s. So what you had was this kind of narrative arc, as it were, of, 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 of psychological practices that, um, that I thought was in, interesting in and of itself. Um, and as part of the um, process of trying to gain access and, and, and do, do the research within the prison system, it was it became very rapidly and very quickly clear uh, in around 2008, 2009, when I was initially applying for to do the research, that I was not going to get access to do the original research in terms of looking at how the risk assessment kind of model was working from both sides. Uh, and at that point, the project swiveled and focused primarily on the people who were doing the forensic psychological practice uh, and doing the risk assessments, delivering offending behavior programs. Um, and at that point, then the project went live, as it were. So. Hey, that's interesting. Why do you think it was that you weren't going to get support for your original idea for the research? Um, I think there was a couple of reasons, and uh, most uh, um, some of these were explicitly stated, and some of them were kind of less explicitly stated. For the ex the explicit reasons was one, as a former lifer, they felt desperately uncomfortable in giving me access to kind of um, uh, people who were being assessed, um, and the kind of vulnerability that came with that. They felt that there was potentially ethical concerns around having someone with my background and my kind of doing this piece of research in a context in where those vulnerabilities were compounded. Um, and I think that's a fair, I think that's a fair point. I think there was a point at which me and my supervisors um, kind of were looking at that and were thinking, actually, yeah, a legitimate concern. There was also uh, another explicit, explicit kind of purpose that was given was that just the complexity of the um, proposed methodology of having, you know, taking into consideration both parties would actually add a level of complexity that would make the kind of resource implications of the of the piece of research more complex than the prison service would be comfortable with doing because obviously i wouldn't be allowed to draw keys it would be multi-site there would be lots of kind of implications in terms of the resourcing of that of that project and i think that that was also a, a fairly legitimate point but there were also some kind of hidden um uh reasons that emerged either later or people spoke to me about um that were more about psychologists at that point feeling like they were a particularly entrenched uh, and embattled group. Um, they had consistently come under kind of critique um, and quite volatile critique from not just prisoner bodies, but also from legal entities um, who were critiquing not just the risk assessment tools, but the whole uh, offending behavior kind of program of events 
that existed in the prison service at that time. So there was a degree to which they felt that their back was against the wall and didn't want further inspection um, upon them. Um, and even when I did manage to get access, that was a consistent problem. Thank you. That, that's very interesting because, I mean, my memory, or my view, I should perhaps say, um, the forensic psychology had had a pretty easy run for a number <laughs> of years. It had become, you know, the dominant, uh, paradigm if paradigm is the right word and really excluded any other yeah, approach um, and uh, and of course the programs like the SOTP um, yeah, dominated yeah, prisons and the drive to get people through those programs which were later shown not to be quite as effective as they claimed um, so, so there's a real I'm talking about the early years of this mm. century. There was a real battle here yeah, going on. And it's interesting to hear your description of that particular story arc. I did find it interesting. But also, it did resonate with me because I actually worked as a prison psychologist in 1993, only for a nine month period, though. But I was tasked with, as I mean, all I had was a degree and a very short period of expert work experience of clinical um, support to, to people with learning disabilities. And myself and another graduate were tasked with going and setting up a psychology department in a young offenders institute. And I literally felt like I was being let loose on people. And I think, you know, as and my very first job was to go and do a risk assessment of a life sentence prisoner for a parole board with absolutely no training whatsoever. So I think there's something about the system does set people up in a way where perhaps they have to be quite defensive and front things out because the there certainly wasn't enough support for people in those roles I you know thankfully I think that's changed quite a lot but I think you know the the formalization was probably a way to try and protect people who you know at 21 22 that's not really the kind of it's it's not it's not a very well, well supported job no, and it's and there was a degree to which I found that there was there were slight different generations of psychologists and their experiences of both their entry, their support, their training, etc., was vastly different. But there was also some, and I, I touch on this very very briefly. Uh, but, but given that I have to had to anonymize uh, for ethical reasons, not only the sites but the regions in which I was operating. Uh, and drawing a sample from, uh, um, uh, uh, largely because the pool of psychologists uh, was not small, but it's not a huge population either. Um, and therefore, you know, even even uh, sort of gendering um, some of the participants would actually reveal who they were because they may have been the only person with that gender in that particular region at that time. So, you know, there was a there was a point which I had to kind of anonymize all that, but. Um, one of the things that we found, or one of the things that I found, was that there was also a kind of regional difference in terms of not just the support, uh, and, and, and I mean fiscal support, so the, the amount of money that was actually in that kind of region to recruit, to train, to put, push people through the, um, the chartership. Um, that became, you know, that kind of emerged much later as the professional kind of qualification for forensic psychologists. Um, and there was, you know, many of the psychologists who had came in in that first generation. So between sort of 1990 and 1995, um, who had come in a very, very junior kind of positions and had in that boom. So if you think in around 1992, there were about 120 to 150 psychologists employed across the prison service. By the time you hit 1998, that's over 1400. So, you know, you all of a sudden you've got a massive boom in, in six years. Um, and lots of that recruitment had been directly out of university. So people finishing their undergraduate degrees uh, who were then employed as um, uh, uh, assistants uh, who would then start their master's. Um, and it would be during the master's program that they would begin that formal training into the chartership um, and then would become kind of... Um, uh, um, uh, I can't remember the title, but move beyond the assistant role 
Um, and it would be the chartered psychologists and the few of them that would be in the kind of management of psychology departments and at region. So, but for a long time, the distance between the chartered forensic psychologist and the assistant was quite wide. That began to shrink as you hit the 2000s, um, and it's much closer now. Um, but there was a period where lots of the people doing much of the very profound work um, were undertrained uh, and in some contexts undersupported. Um, and inevitably that kind of leads to a kind of ontological insecurity and a kind of narrative insecurity. And I think lots of that and the legacies of that were playing into that kind of hesitancy um, in terms of engaging with the project. Mm, yeah, great. So in, in one place you referred to uh, forensic psychologists as the folk devil of the prison system. What kind of expectations uh, and or inverted commas bias did you bring to your research, do you think? Well, I think I think there's two things that were going on with that. I think I bought I was very cynical um, in the initial stages of my project, um, you know, and I had seen this not just the forensic psychological power uh, practice kind of evolve into this semi dominating kind of discourse within prisons. But with that had come this kind of terrible power that was associated with it, specifically in terms of the risk assessment kind of model and the manner in which that began to play quite significantly into the parole processes and categorization of, of prisoners. Um, so I was I was kind of very cynical and um, um, disturbed that here was a branch of power operating in our system that was under investigated, under explored, under critiqued, and often not seemingly not recognized by the very people who were exercising that power. Um, and I think it's that latter point, that lack of recognition that they are wielding that power, that resulted in a lot of people who were subject to their power resisting, rejecting, and um, uh, uh, not only the kind of the discipline of forensic psychology itself, but the individuals. And of course, lots of the lots of the um, uh, very voiceless kind of uh, that's not even a word voiceless kind of assaults on um, psychologists that were taking place in the prison newspapers. Uh, and in legal journals outside, were almost directed at individuals um, rather than the discipline as a whole or the practice as a whole. So also you began to get, you know, this idea of the psychologist um, um, was all of a sudden kind of somewhat toxic in the kind of landscape of the prison system and the criminal justice system. Um, and what you hadn't had on top of that was um, a kind of compounding issue with the formalization of forensic psychological practice. So, you know, you had these things kind of emerging and kind of feeding off each other that created this idea of, you know, to use Stan Cohen's um, kind of idea of the folk devil, you know, a point of target of which you can collapse lots of complex kind of identity issues into a kind of reified, you know, model of someone who is, you know, um, um, uh, uh, um, the kind of idealized other. And I think that's what had begun to occur. So, uh, you know, even academics were beginning to pick up in the late 1990s, early 2000s on this idea of the psychologist as being deeply problematic. So if you look at like Ben Cruz um, research that was conducted in the early 2000s in uh a particular prison i'm not going to name it even though it's not open anymore um and you know he had identified in that that psychological power and the manner in which that was engaged with was deeply problematic not just for the institution but for the system more widely um so you know you'd had this kind of ramping up of this rhetoric and of this idea so by the time that i started to do my field work not only was that kind of perception of forensic psychologists in particular um, um, established, it was it also started to bleed into the way that they engaged professionally within the prison. 
Thank you. Can I just ask you, Naomi, whether that resonates with you at all? You know, that sense of being in a profession under attack from all sides? Absolutely. I think it's really hard to find your place within the system in terms of how do you belong when you're in a minority group? I think often as well, given that most most forensic psychologists are female and most prisoners are male, um, you're also you're managing being different in that that regard. And I think some of the, um, I mean, it's not it's not unique to female clinicians, but I think some of the attacks that you face from you know you've got prisoners and then um, male officers, which I think will probably come up in during the course of the discussion. But the amount of sexism and misogyny that you face in those environments and not that's not all coming from prisoners by by any stretch of the imagination um you know it's it's a lot um rumors about your sexuality your sexual orientation um you know I, there were rumors that i'd been sacked from a previous job for having made porn films or been a prostitute you know that's the kind of that just that's par for the course you know coping with those kind of malicious rumours that spread about people. Yeah, yeah. and actually, uh, you know, I, I, I think we're going to come on to this later, but yeah, I mean, for many of the for many of my participants, those that identified those as issues, it was not necessarily prisoners that were the main problem. Um, it was other staff members, and therefore there was the kind of betrayal of that, you know, that, you know, there's this idea that as a staff member within a prison, we're all in it together. Um, but actually, because they face, many of the people I spoke to faced very hostile kind of reception from prison staff, uniform prison staff in particular, um, which was heavily tinted by misogyny, sexism, um, and um, if we're being honest, sexual harassment and sexual bullying, um, that also then kind of acted as a further kind of disruption to that sense of belonging in the workplace um and feeling comfortable in the workplace um that kind of fed back into lots of those other issues i spoke to, spoke about before absolutely i mean I, I probably would just like to add that I, you know a overwhelming majority of people that i worked with um officers and prisoners were really decent in their interactions um you know we're talking about a minority but it's a, a significant enough minority to make having to brace yourself yeah. to go to work i mean it was what one of those it was a, it was an element of my research that i had not even particularly considered in the kind of lead up to it what actually what actually kind of led to that was i was randomly at a charity event and um you know mid kind of hors d'oeuvre in my mouth and two glasses of wine in my hand um uh, a young woman came up to me and was like oh you're you're the person who's doing research on forensic psychologists and I was like yeah and she was like oh, I used to be a forensic psychologist I left because of and then proceeded to tell me quite a horrific story of um uh, of being um harassed and and stalked in in, in fact uh, to the point where she'd had to move completely um, to a different area of the country uh, from when she, from where all her family was and where she'd initially been based. And she had said to me very explicitly, you need to ask people about this. Um, so it was in the very first kind of interviews where I sort of like, you know, I've heard blah, blah, blah. Does this, you know, does this ring any truth to you? And all of a sudden floodgates would open and people would just start talking about it. So, um, and I think of all the um, uh, uh, women participants or those who identified as women participants, all of them had some experience of this to varying degrees. Uh, and subsequently, after I had finished the PhD and was kind of on the on the circuit of doing presentations about it, the sheer number of forensic psychologists or former forensic psychologists or those that had left the public sector and gone into private practice, um, the sheer number of them that came up to me and was like, and just told me even more stories. Um, so I ended up with, you know, uh, more and more and more. So there's actually more in the book um, than there is in the PhD. And I, there's even more that have subsequently found their way into other publications, um, you know, um, but it was a profound element of the stories that people told me 
which was often completely contrasted by the experiences of male psychologists who didn't recognize that that was a reality. But they were only a few, you know, few and far between uh, at that point in time. But yeah, they, they, you know, so there's one account that I give in the book where two people had overlapped in the same establishment. And the woman was like, this place is horrendous. It's full of misogynists. It's, you know, it's bullying, sexual harassment. I had to leave there as quickly as I could, blah, blah, blah. And the bloke was like, it's the best place I've ever worked. You know, so you had this kind of real contrast in the kind of gendered experiences of the of the prison and its environment. And I think, you know, there might be something there also about, I think there's a couple of factors in terms of actually this contagion, you know, so actually hatred of women um, is there for some of the population and that's likely to be contagious and and um, spread about the, the atmosphere. And equally, uh, I guess, fear. So if you're read as a woman, if you're reading lots of accounts of rape or murder of women, then actually you might also be bringing that that sensitivity into the interaction. Both those biases could be could be there. But I suppose the other point I wanted to make as well is it's not, you know, it's it goes up to quite high levels as well in terms of, you know, it's not just the la- officers working on the landing, but also governors mm. being, you know, at times explicitly um harassing in their in their behaviour and getting away with that. And they're they're the people who have ultimate control over the the prison. So a lot of power. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's a it brings to mind an experience I had at Grendon where a, a female colleague had been recently appointed to a senior position and within her first week uh, she went out to go home and found there was blood smeared all over the windscreen of her car and we we never got to the bottom of of that but clearly it was kind of indicative of the same kind of dynamic that you're talking about there Jason. yeah and i and i think we i think there is a degree to which we kind of we've got to see that gendered nature of that hostility as a furtherance of the kind of hostility that outsiders are perceived within the prison service anyway so lots of the psychologists even when they weren't talking about gendered issues were like you know often they were targeted uh, for very negative banter or for never, you know, banter is a particularly problematic issue. Uh, but they were either targeted for very negative banter or were targeted um, specifically during security briefings. So almost like in the very first day of their, their, their employment, you know, they would be picked on as like, you know, it's people like this who are vulnerable to grooming. It is people like this who are smuggling and trafficking in goods. Uh, against the good order and discipline of the prison. So, you know, that idea that the uniform prison body and that the prison itself is operating in such a way as to safeguard the inside of the prison, you know, that any of these people, professionals, who are interlopers into that context are an inherent threat. Um, and actually, we uh, I saw quite a lot of that in the accounts of forensic co- psychologists that I spoke to, but also in uh, specifically gate staff, uh, in prisons, um, and in some regards, you know, other officers, because uh, simultaneously, as I was writing the book, I was working in the third sector, delivering um, um, some projects in prisons. Um, and, you know, you get talking to staff, and they'd be like, so what do you do? And I'm like, oh, I investigate forensic psychologists. And the sheer number of anti-psychological services, so not necessarily the people themselves, but the services, the sheer volume of, and you know, um, of negative rhetoric that I got from prison officers about psychologists was almost as kind of endemic as as the kind of anti psychology um, kind of view that you got from lots of prisoners and certainly prisoners on the indeterminate sentences. So. All of which resonates, and you're right. It's not gender specific. You know, one of when I went back to work in a prison, but for the NHS much later on, um, one of the male nurses that I was working alongside warned me, "Don't do anything to piss anybody off, because if you do, you'll come out and find your tires slashed." Yeah. Um, and you know, male colleague who was reported for bringing in a multi pack of Mars bars under yeah. suspicion that he must be bringing in ten Mars bars because he was going to, um, you know give them to prisoners rather yeah. than the fact he might just be bringing 10 Mars bars in because he, he's got a sugar addiction. Yeah. I mean, one of the things, so in the book, I talk about how 
um, the forensic psychologists, even though they are incredibly powerful as an entity within the prison system, are actually, uh, you know, <laughs> actually subject to the power of the institution itself and are subject to the individual. So this is where the concept of vulnerability comes in. But one of the things that we found, I found quite significantly was that there were these two forms of um, kind of dominance that psychologists were subject to. One was kind of impositional dominance uh, and the other was isolational dominance. And impositional dominance was could involve all sorts of things from banter to practical jokes to, uh, you know, even more kind of extreme uh, events. So, um, one of the um, psychologists that I interviewed on a very minor scale, they said that their office was in the, like the bowels of the prison. You know, they were like right on the ground floor. There was no what light. So they were um, uh, sorry, no windows. So they were utterly reliant upon the fluorescent lamps in their light. And on a regular basis, the staff would come and steal their fluorescent lights. Uh, or and unplug all their computers and um, you know or, or glue up the filing cabinets so that they you know just these kind of minor kind of um, hassles but that actually had quite a profound impact on the psychologists a ability to do their work and b how they felt in the kind of the context of the prison um, but there was also you know so there was that kind of and that was just indiscriminately targeted at everyone but then there were really kind of gendered and misogynistic so there was one person who accounted to me that she had found consistently would find porn imagery uh, in her desk drawer or in her books or in her kind of files um, and that wasn't happening to others in the psychology department that was being directly at, directed at her um you know a really graphic kind of pornography um for instance but... these are extraordinary uh, accounts aren't they really so given what you've been saying and obviously you've done your research why do you think psychologists are a relatively unresearched group in the uh, prison prison life um I think there's kind of I think there's three reasons. I think one and I think the first is really about the operation of their power. So and and this has a kind of double barreled effect. So one, it kind of their power is hidden really within the kind of matrices of power that exist within the prison. Um, and that's because often when they're doing friends, when they're doing risk assessments, when they're doing uh, uh, LIFO reports, when they're doing parole reports, et cetera, you know, they do a piece of work at point A, they make a recommendation that is picked up by someone at point B, and then a decision is made somewhere much later down the road at point C, and then that decision impacts on the person that they've done the review on. So actually, you know, there is a wide range of discrepancy between their act and the effect of their act. Um, and I think that kind of people because people have not they don't see it happening directly you know there's been some confusion about the manner in which their power operates which i also think hides their power from themselves sometimes because they're not seeing the product of their labor actually you know and that impacts on the manner in which they you know uh, gain satisfaction from work etc cetera, etc cetera, and everything else but it also plays a role in you know not perceiving themselves as powerful um um, within a within a context in which their discipline and their expertise is seen as incredibly powerful, um, so I think there's there's that element that plays to that. I think a second element is that it happened almost so quickly that kind of evolution. And I mean, I know we're talking sort of twenty years in terms of that evolution, but actually, when it comes to the prison service, twenty years is very very quick. You know, I, I always I hear the same account from prison governors all the time that, you know, the prison service is like a huge tanker ship. It takes forever to turn it around and to move it off in a different direction. Uh, and I, I, I don't know if this is in the training manual, but nearly every governor I've ever spoke to has used the same metaphor. Um, so that but that period of moving from like 120 psychologists to 1400 psychologists in six years, I mean, it was a massive kind of just explosion not only of kind of discourse and expertise and the enrollment of that into the operations of the prison, but also the manner in which that then exercised power as it existed beyond the, the prison wall. Because if you think about most power that operates within prisons, 
it's confined within the boundaries of the prison wall, whereas forensic psychological expertise actually exists outside of the wall. So it's not something that's engendered within the prison. It is imported from without. Um, so, And I think that that kind of importation um, actually plays a role in the manner in which, the, you know, that they have not really kind of um, uh, been subject to kind of close sociological scrutiny. There are now a number of projects. So Joe Shingler uh, has done some good work on on, on psychology, psychological practices in prisons. Uh, is it Michelle Brown, I think, has also done some good work. Uh, and there's a currently, there's a PhD student at Cambridge who was a forensic psychologist in the prison service and is now doing a, a, a much larger piece of work than I did on forensic psychologists and their experiences in the prisons. So that that's beginning to occur. But I do think that there is another, and this is now with my cynical hat on, I do think that there is another kind of reason. Uh, and this relates to the National Research Committee that was established uh, primarily as a as an ethics review board, and then from about 2016 onwards, not an ethics review board, but actually as a mechanism of um, assessing access. So you get this split and you get this kind of confusion about what the NRC actually does. It no longer operates as an ethics committee and hasn't for about eight years, but it's still perceived as an ethics board. So you've got this real kind of complex kind of uh, uh, ideation of what that committee does. But the vast majority of people that were on that committee at one point were regional forensic psychologists uh, or psychologists operating at regional level. And particular methodologies, particular foci, particular um, areas of concern, particular critiques um, became barred. Um, not in any kind of overt way, but I mean, you mentioned SOTP earlier, you know, there was a piece of internal research or a, a a commissioned piece of internal research. So someone operating outside the prison coming in to do an internal piece of evaluation on the SOTP where their results were embargoed. Uh, and, 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 you know, you know, uh, the uh, research into uh, sex and sexuality and relationships in prisons was also then, you know, had its NRC kind of approval withdrawn. So the people that were doing that research, even though it had been ethically approved, at their institution had their access withdrawn, so could no longer do that research. And I think that there, some of those issues have also played into this, not silencing, because it hasn't been quite a silencing, but this lack of per um, uh, um, um, focus. Does that so, make sense? Yeah, I'm not, I, sure, I, I, not entirely think, sure that made sense, but, you know. I think what you're saying, in a couple of words, is, is that you think the constituents of the uh, committee influenced what got through really yeah. one way or another yeah that's a much better way of putting it yeah and and not not maliciously no and i think that's i think you know because i've been a, not necessarily accused of this before uh, in the past but you know people are like oh you're saying that psychologists blocked research and i'm like well in effect yes but not in intent you know, it's because that didn't match the priorities that the prison service had. The priorities were do SOTP work. Does Horizon and whatever the one that followed SOTP, does that work? Does the cognitive behavioral program or the R&R &R program or the thinking skills program, do those have efficacy? You know, those were the concerns. And that's where, you know, the kind of um, 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 perspective of what research had value to the prison service kind of got established. So anything that didn't match that kind of interest or utility for the prison service um, was kind of sidelined to some degree. Um, and is still sidelined to some degree. You know, if you look at the operational concerns of the prison service or HMPPS now and the manner in which the NRC view what is operationally valuable to the prison service, very it's a very narrow focus or a very narrow set of concerns that they will view positively doesn't that reflect something of how the prison service functions generally though in that it's quite a silo oh, yeah. you know there's not much outward looking so there's lots of kind of like inner 
inner directed inwards mm. rather than looking out to see what might be useful or helpful and find different and I guess the beauty of what you're highlighting is actually if you have researchers who are free to make proposals for things that they found to be of interest that might mm. not synchronize with might not align with the prison service values but actually th- there might be some really interesting discoveries through yeah. that research that could actually change practice further down the line but it would be a, it would be taking a very different course yeah I remember going to see and I, I'm terrible with memory so I can't remember his name but he was a Canadian forensic psychologist and uh, I went to see him give a talk about it was the kind of the state of forensic psychology it was a kind of overview of forensic psychology around the world and and one of the points that he made and it was an almost throwaway point but one of the points that he made was that forensic psychology has been so busy or so concerned with producing forensic psychologists that actually it's the development of forensic psychology as a discipline has slowed so actually what you've got is this it's a kind of you know you're producing people that can do very particular discrete pieces of work you're not actually teaching them to think forensically in terms of psychology um and what he said is that 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 problem means that some of the critical turns, the clinical psychology, the health psychology, the cognitive psychology, you know, um, have been through. Actually, some of that kind of internal critique and that kind of internal kind of um, um, assessment and uh, uh, evolution has not actually occurred or has been much slower in forensic psychology as a discipline than um, you would see in other fields. Um and I think that has also played quite a significant role in the manner in which forensic psychologists operate and the manner in which that kind of stultifies kind of the research that could be possible. Um, you know, I mean, for, for a very long time, and I think this is still true to this day, the prison service is the major employer of forensic psychological graduates. Oh, yeah, that, I'm, I'm sure that's right, they. Yeah. Hardly exist anywhere <laughs> anywhere else. I think more and more have been uh, recruited to work in particular health services, health service settings these days. David, I, I wanted to ask you a question, actually, just thinking yeah. about your kind of like this psychodynamic perspective on things. But, you know, I think what Jason seems to be describing is a kind of rigidity about role. And and yet we know, don't we, that working in situations when people feel frightened, their, their, their thinking becomes less flexible. So that can bring about rigid because, you know, that role kind of like rigidity that you're describing Jason I had you know we worked in a where worked in a service where the admin team literally one person was responsible for just doing photocopying someone else responsible for just doing typing someone else for doing minute taking rather and instead of recognizing that that would lead to very boring jobs with people with very little skills um but in a way maybe you you're describing something quite similar around psychology and maybe it's something about the system itself that you know produces this inflexibility of mm. thoughts which i wondered what your thoughts were david sorry i didn't quite get the, the question name well I suppose, I was thinking about the lack of you know the that when people are frightened when there's a lot of anxiety around that people become less, less flexible don't they and whether the system's uh, the, the ability to induce fear in people might actually contribute to a more of a rigidity in a profession it might not just be about the profession looking inwards but might be something about the context within which it occurs yeah I I suppose you know what that makes me think of is working as a psychotherapist and you know now with you as a psychologist because you know Naomi is a clinical psychologist as well as being a forensic psychologist you spend a lot of time uh in a room with somebody and to work at your best you're working really at the edge of your emotional uh, experience and sometimes you're in the position of thinking you may tip over the edge so you have to learn to yeah. to 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 not think you have to respond so you know discovering how to not do something and not to say something how not to be panicked into responses you know, very much a part of the 
uh, psychologists, uh, psychotherapist training. But you're reminding me of a situation at Grendon 20 years ago where the tension between the psychotherapist and the psychologist was so strong that all logic who went out the door, I mean, looking back now, I can say and think that was crazy. You know, some of the things mm. that were said and some of the things that were done were awful. Even some of the things I said uh, were terrible and I feel ashamed of them you know, now. But when you get into that sort of state, you know, when you're feeling under such great threat. I think also in, in, in with the forensic psychologist that I spoke to, there were two other kind of issues um, that kind of really fed, fed into that. And I think so but before I get to those two issues, I think the chartership process actually was introduced to kind of break that so that actually in order to become chartered, you've had to demonstrate that you had skills across the board in forensic psychological practice. But actually, for many of the people that I spoke to, they couldn't complete the chartered chartership because actually they were frozen within a prison context in which they were just being asked to do a singular thing over and over and over and over again because the caseloads was so huge and that the churn of people was so huge and therefore the case files that they were dealing with were so packed but also packed with information that was not necessarily coherent not necessarily um 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 uh, 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 uh straightforwardly ordered even um you know the files you know become kind of the, a living thing on in and of themselves so you know and, and but that churn really kind of compounded this so what you ended up with was firstly so forensic psychologists with almost no ability to spend any time with the people that they were supposedly working with um and i you know i remember uh, uh, one of one of my participants telling me that you know ideally they should meet a prisoner three times before um submitting a report on that person so they meet them initially then they have an interview with them in order to do the kind of the bulk work and then they should have a feedback uh meeting with that individual and then you know clarify any kind of inconsistencies errors etc cetera, etc cetera, in in the report before then submitting it and and she admitted to me that actually that very very rarely happened and actually the first meeting was often the one that resulted in them having to write the report because they were operating on such a delay and were so behind um and that just didn't have the kind of um uh workload hours in order to be able to do the job that they wanted to do in the way that they should be doing it so actually there was this kind of operational kind of impetus to just doing a singular thing over and over and over again in a very rushed fashion i think the second thing that emerged out of that's also related to churn um was that the prison service didn't want them to do other things you know it was you know it wasn't just about the caseload that actually the prison service had employed them to do a very specific task and that's what it wanted them to do. So all of a sudden, when they're trying to demonstrate other forensic psychological skills, the prison itself acted as a barrier to that. Um, and meant that, you know, I, I spoke to one person who I think the the um, from the point that you have a master's, it's supposed to take something like six years. There's different scales, but I think six years is the, the point at which you're supposed to get to the chartership. And she was nearly 10 years in and had, was nowhere near. And we, even the first stage of it so absolutely you could you could do an undergraduate degree get some work experience and then do a three-year doctorate in clinical psychology in the amount of time it was taking people to to go from being a graduate to being a forensic psychologist we had people that took nine years yeah for just because the process was so crazy yeah um but moving but on was, a bit sorry i was just sorry, gonna no, just to come in on that point what yeah. was interesting was that the you know, as I spoke, there was kind of these different generations of psychologists. Mm -hmm. Much of the later generation of psychologists got their chartership outside of the prison service before going into the prison service in order to be forensic psychologist, because someone had kind of given them a heads up much earlier in the process. Like, if you come mm -hmm. into the prison, you're not going to get this done. So you're better off working in kind of youth justice or some other context in which you can do that work before entering into the prison service. But then, of course, as they're entering into the prison service, they're not on the ground floor. They're yeah. often operating either as the management of the psychology department 
or in the uh, senior management team of the prison or at region. Um, you know, so, <laughs> you know, that even they weren't getting to do the kind of groundwork and all they were doing was supervising others who were doing the groundwork on the, on, on, you know, in the prison. Sorry, I keep thinking. <laughs> no, incredibly frustrating when, you know, I think most people become forensic psychologists, although you might correct me, but I think most people probably become forensic psychologists because they they want to contribute something useful to society and they're interested in people and want to work with people, not because they want to be writing reams and reams of reports. No, no, I, exactly. You know, I, and I think this is one of the things that probably goes to the, my cynicism, Um um, and the erosion of my cynicism to some degree was that nearly every person I spoke to, no, in fact, every person I spoke to, it wasn't nearly everyone, it was everyone that I spoke to and everyone that I've spoken to subsequently, was that their key motivation was in whatever fashion it was, because the different people had different kind of motivations, but it was always a moral motivation. And behind that moral motivation was doing some good in some way. You know, whether that was, you know, looking after kind of, um, uh, or you know, working towards public protection and, you know, looking after people from the criminal justice system and victims and this, that, the other, or whether it was, you know, people with more welfareist concerns who were actually concerned with, you know, the people that they were working with and, uh, you know, the people that I refer to. So I, one of the things I didn't expect to come out of my research was this kind of typology of moral practice. Um, and I, I, it, it kind of smacked me in the face every time I spoke to someone. They were like, "No, I want to do this," and or I see people in this particular way, or I see forensic psychology in this particular way. So I ended up with these kind of different groups. Um, you know, humanists are the people that really wanted to work very closely with prisoners. You know, and they often had a real kind of profound understanding of the the the, the traumatic lives that many prisoners had, had kind of experienced. You had kind of, uh, um, uh, so, you know, I kind of used a quadrant in order to kind of define this. So, you know, the top of the quadrant was, uh, or oh, to the right of the quadrant was this idea of um, uh, welfare. At the top of the kind of re, uh, of the quadrant was this idea of rehabilitation. So many people had kind of bought into this idea that they wanted to do rehabilitative work, you know, and that they really wanted to help people live better lives. Um, the bottom of the kind of quadrant was um, this idea of punitivity. So people who saw the punishment of people in prisons as a moral good in and of itself. Um, and then you had people who I, I kind of label as functionalists who were really about public protection and, and that actually they saw their work as safeguarding the public. So actually what you've got is, but it doesn't matter which quadrant you're coming from, you've got this idea that they are doing a moral good. Um, and the, that was the motivation. You know, no one there, no one was there to keep people in prison. You know, yeah, there was a couple, but, um, you know, a couple of them were like, there are some people who should never be released. But, you know, um, but the vast majority, you know, they really wanted to do good and they wanted to be seen to be doing good. And they wanted to, you know, help society and help people. Um and actually, that that those kind of motivations played a big part in the churn of staff, because retention was very low between kind of two thousand and four and uh, twenty fifteen. The retention of psychological staff was incredibly low, um, because people would come into the prison service going, "Yeah, I'm going to save people," and then all of a sudden would see what was going on and go, "Oh no, I'm not saving anyone," um, and then would leave very quickly and often retrain into either clinical or health um, or counselling. You know, they would kind of retrain into that area, um, which is a shame because I think they're probably the people who the prison service should have kept. Um, you know. So you can hear that um, forensic psychologists might change their own perspective on how satisfying that might be as a career, but I wondered whether your own perspective on forensic psychologists changed during the course of your research. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, as I said at the start, I was quite cynical um, and I remain quite cynical about forensic psychological practice. I'm no longer cynical about the people. Um, and I think that that was a division that I had, like many other people in the prison service, actually, had not quite made. And I think, you know, it was 
talking to because you know this is the thing when if you're in prison or if you work in prison or if you're delivering services in prison you know you see a psychologist walking down the corridor you're like hiya you don't get to have a conversation with them you know everyone's too busy so but sitting down with them and you know i think my shortest interview was nearly two hours and i think my longest interview was nearly five um and people just opened up and they would talk about their lives and you know and it was just and i realized that even the people that i felt that i could not agree with um it was very clear that they saw themselves in as trying to do something good um there was a degree of denial for some of those people in what the prison service does and what the prison service is getting them to do um which i thought was quite interesting there's kind of neutralizing of their own power um but i think that kind of relates to they're not really being aware of what their power is and the effects of it um but it was seeing that like humanize these people who often are couched as you know individuals who wield a terrible power um but it was seeing them and them describe their vulnerability and them describe their kind of humanness that kind of changed my perspective and, and made me divorce between the practitioner and the practice. Well, that's been an enormously rich conversation, uh, Jason, and you managed to answer all our questions without them even being asked. Um, <laughs> so full of uh, detail. <laughs> so finally, what changes would you like to see as a consequence of your research do you think oh i think there's there's a few um and i'm actually going to go beyond what i've said in the book i'm going to be a bit more radical than what i said in the book um i think firstly i think there are so one of the things that i found actually was that women were protecting themselves and uh and either kind of armoring or kind of avoiding the kind of sexism misogyny that they experienced but as part of that, there was a widespread kind of whisper network that operated amongst the women working in those prisons. Um, and I, I I think whisper networks are important because people get to share, you know, who's a problem, who's not a problem, where, you know, it's that the other. But I think when an institution is reliant upon a whisper network for keeping the women in who are working there safe, I think that's de I think that's deeply problematic. And I think there needs to be a much more open and honest conversation to begin with about the experiences of women working in the prison service. And that's not just about psychologists. That's about women working in the prison service. Um, and I think and I don't think until that conversation begins is the safety of those individuals and of those people uh, is always going to be in question. Um, and I and I think that needs to happen. Um, and I and I think that's long overdue. But I also think that there's a lot of denial that that is actually occurring. So I don't think until the conversation starts, you're not going to breach that kind of denial barrier. Uh, so I think that needs to happen first and foremost. Secondly, I think sorry, I'm going to do my chair again. Uh, secondly, I think the what needs to happen is in the training of forensic psychologists. I think we need, and there's two elements to this. Firstly, I think we need to train forensic psychologists to recognize and operate the power that they have in a way that enables them to recognize what that power is. And I mean, we know from, you know, other contexts and, um, you know, and other authors, and, you know, I'm thinking of Hannah Arendt, for instance, you know, uh, you know, in her, in some of her work around totalitarianism, you know, she she argues that, you know, the people who wield power, especially in bureaucratized kind of systems, often don't recognize that they wield that power, and are therefore, you know, the 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 kind of moral and ethical kind of concerns related to that power often pass them by because they're not taught to think about those things. They're taught to do the job. So, and I think, you know, so in the training of forensic psychologists, I think there needs to be a much more kind of open conversation about A, what their power is, B, how that power operates, C, what the impact of that power can be, and D, how they can operate, work with that power in 
a more positive way. I think, you know, that needs to happen. I also think that there is a kind of epistemic change that needs to occur. I think we've had, for instance, uh, one of the core that you look at any forensic psychology kind of module that's taught at university and beyond, Andrews and Bonter's work on the psychology of criminal conduct has absolutely dominated uh, and still dominates. I mean, it's in its thick edition that's just come out this year, I think, you know, and it's absolutely dominated forensic psychological practice. But the original ideas for that were, you know, were published in 1994 and really came out of research that was conducted in the late 1980s. In terms of causality models, in terms of criminality, very outdated. Um, and there are significantly other or significant other pieces of work that are outside of forensic psychology and psychology itself, where that kind of causality um, um, uh, dynamic has been explored in a much more sophisticated way. So I think going back to the training of forensic psychologists, I think we need to kind of open their minds a little bit more to move beyond these kind of these quite old fashioned ideas of crime causality um, that are specifically grounded in uh, quite odd ideas of biology, of race, um, of gender, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, we kind of, you know, we need an advancement in that kind of epistemic uh, understanding of the issue. What else do I think needs to happen? Uh, I think there needs to be a greater recognition at the parole board um, about the limitations of forensic psychology and what risk assessment tools can do. So one of the big complaints that many psychologists told me about was then being asked to do a risk assessment tool that would hold its validity not only at the individual level which obviously they can't because they're designed to operate at a population level so you know being asked to use this kind of tool for a specific individual in a specific time in a specific context that would hold across a changing kind of dynamic um and you know and even the best dynamic risk assessment tool just can't do that but they were being asked to do that uh, and in some ways we're being forced to do that by the parole board because of a lack of understanding at the parole board on the limitations of those kind of technologies and that practice. So I think we need to, we need, that needs to be addressed because that kind of feeds back down to the very practice of forensic psychologists and many of the issues that they then face. Um, Isn't that partly though also the parole board not managing their own anxiety? about making you know ultimately they're supposed to be making decisions but it's almost like they want to be fed um yeah. but, you know that this person is safe or not safe and then they can rubber stamp it and there's never going to be that kind of guarantee is you know yeah. any decision is always going to be about weighing up a yeah. balance of factors isn't it yeah and i think you know there are very specific keynote cases that we can look at that have impacted on that the rice case is a, is a prime example of this what you got with the Rice case was someone who, you know, had been released by the parole board, committed a very serious further offence, um, and then was kind of back. And then there was a serious case review into what had happened, you know, and this has occurred repeatedly. But one of the problems that occurs with those serious case reviews is that they kind of commit a kind of logical fallacy in that they assume that because an event has happened, it could have been predicted. Uh, and the, the parole board and the psychologist and whoever is involved should have been able to predict that it was occurring. And of course, that's actually, you know, hindsight being 2020 and all that, you, you know, as events are evolving, you can't you can't predict in that particular way. Um, you know, that's not the manner in which prediction and statistical modeling works. Um, certainly not when you've got something as complex as a human being, you know, and the kind of multiple variables that can go into any kind of decision making. So. I think, you know, that kind of the problem that exists inherent to those serious case reviews have shaped the manner in which the parole board now perceives these issues, which then feeds back on the pressure for forensic psychologists and others, you know, the probation service as well, uh, in terms of how they operate, where they operate, what their decisions making. But that's because you've got this diffusing of responsibility through this very opaque system of bureaucracy um which is what bureaucratic systems are designed to do you know go back to weber and his rationalization of organizations but brilliant thank you very much
Jason, you're clearly very passionate about <laughs> your subject, and that comes across uh, you know, very powerfully indeed. But um, you've mentioned cynicism you know, several times in the course of the conversation. So how do you keep yourself you know, buoyed up and refreshed, refreshed and from being too cynical? Um, well, I think one of the I think there's a practical kind of, you know, obviously wine helps, um, you know, <laughs> and chocolate and sticky toffee pudding, um, you know, all the good things in the world. But um, I think there's a practical issue and also a distance one, a pro uh, you know, a proximity one. So I think practically the methodology that I used in terms of this research was incredibly useful. So um, I used a kind of uh, an adapted version of uh, appreciative inquiry. Now, appreciative inquiry often gets a bad rep because people think it's about looking for the positives. It's not. What it is is about framing a question in such a way that it doesn't limit a person's answer to a purely negative response. Because what you're trying to do is get them to give you both the positive and the negative so that you can contrast their answer. And that's what the model is, work, is designed to do. Now, appreciative inquiry is often utilized in both. A kind, there's a kind of ethnographic element to it and an interview and a survey element. It kind of is the combination of those three that combines in order to produce the data that you work with. Obviously, I couldn't do the ethnographic elements of this, and I'm statistically ignorant, so I wasn't going to do the survey elements of this either. So what it meant was that I was purely having to focus on the interview elements. But then that meant that I had to use, or you know, this kind of adapted form of um, um, appreciative inquiry, which I call appreciative informed inquiry, um, um, as a me um, as a mechanism of constructing the interview schedules. So what I was constantly doing is, if someone was, you know, it's all horrible, it's all shit here, you know, and I'd be like, okay, so what what was your best day at work then? Oh, well, I did this. Oh, okay, so you know, and then you can begin to contrast that. And one of the benefits of that was that was the process that led to the humanization of the people that I was speaking to, because I got, I didn't just get their cynicism. I didn't just get their bad day. I didn't just get their embattled kind of bitterness. What I got was the contrast for them telling me what they enjoyed about their work, what they thought was a good day at work, what they thought the benefits of their role were, plus the obverse positions of those kind of questions. So actually it, it enabled me to have a much more kind of humane and humanizing conversation with my participants. So I think that was one thing that kind of um, uh, eroded my cynicism with regards to the individuals. I think secondly was proximity. It took me a long time to both recruit, to interview, to analyze, to write up and then publish the book. Um, and I think it was having that distance from the field work to the point of analysis um actually benefited me because lots of the emotion had kind of subsided and actually i was able to look at what these people were saying and what they were telling me and think about what they were telling me rather than how i felt about what they were telling me um and i think that also i you know the kind of quite sommelian idea of proximity and distance but you know, I think that also played a significant role in because it's very easy if you're doing prison related work to become very cynical very quickly um, and that to have quite a toxic impact on the manner in which you conceptualize, analyze, ask questions, etc. So, yeah, I think, you know, the, the kind of happenstance of circumstance um, in which, you know, I ran out of money and needed to get a job doing something else, then, you know, kind of enabled me to 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 get that kind of both emotional and cognitive and intellectual distance from from the material itself um and i hope then that that came across in the kind of latter stages of the book i know that there's been hesitation from a lot of psychologists about reading the book because they feel that it might just be an ex-con attacking them and what they do um but i hope that anyone who does read it would recognize that that is not what happened you know not at all. I found it really empathic, actually, and compassionate for the position of not not uncritical, but but the critic the critique being justified and necessary. But I, I thought there was a lot of empathy and compassion in the book, and a lot of it, you know, really resonated for me as a psychologist who's worked in prison. I wasn't employed by 
HMPPS for the bulk of that time. Um, but certainly the issues are not unfamiliar. Um, so, yeah, so I think it's a fantastic book and would really recommend that anyone in, curious about the work of forensic psychologists thinking about a career as a forensic psychologist does read it. And it's um, it's not a difficult read. It's very accessible. Oh, thank you. You know, as a writer, that's about the most that's about the the best thing anyone can ever say to you. You know, what I mean? so thank you for that. Yeah. Excellent. So just to remind people, it's called Forensic Psychologists, Prisons, Power and Vulnerability. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Jason. It's not quite one o'clock, but it's not far off. <laughs> Many thanks. Been great meeting you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Take yeah, care. Thank, thank you. Really enjoyed that.